Okay, now children, let's just um, think for a few moments before you go through to your classes. I want to just speak today about something that's taking place outside of my study window in the manse. And it happens about this time every year. On, the, on a tree just nearby uh, the manse window, uh, there's a nesting box. It's just a, bo a wooden box with a wee hole in it, which allow little birds, blue tits, to go through and make their nest. And what I find happening is that at this time every year, uh, for the last two or three years since I've actually had uh, that uh, box up on the tree, this happens at this time every year. And that's a reminder to us of some important things as well about our own lives. For a start, these blue tits know what that box is for. They know that that's a nesting box. They know what to do. They go into the box, they take all sorts of stuff in to make their nest, and then they lay eggs. We chickens, we chicks are then um, uh, develop in the box until they're ready to fly out. And it's great to watch them finally when they fly out of the box. So they know what that box is for. Now that should be the case for yourselves today. What are we here for? What is the Bible for? What is our gathering in church for? It's to worship God. God made us to worship Him. God created us. And I know you're looking at uh, in your syllabus today in Sunday school and in uh, Tweenies as well at God making things. And as part of His creation, these blue tits, as they come back and forth to the nesting box with the stuff that they build their nest with, and with food for the babies when they come to hatch. Well, that's all of God's creation, isn't it? And God created ourselves as well in a special way. And in a special way, he created us for himself so that we would know him as God and as our friend, as our savior. And so through Jesus, we come to know what our Bible is for, what coming to church is for, what it's all about. The second thing that reminded me of was that they come back every springtime to this. Now, I don't know if it's the same pair of blue tits this time. I can't really tell. Um, I'm not an expert in these things. They look very like each other anyway. Maybe it's a different pair. I don't know. Maybe it's the same pair. But anyway, they've come back again this year, the same time of year. And that's so true also of the Bible, isn't it, and of coming to church. It's not just now and again. It's not just that you pick it up once or twice a year or come to church just occasionally when you may feel like it. So important to come every week, every opportunity, and it's absolutely wonderful to see so many young ones and older ones too, let me say, who come regularly to church to worship God, to listen to the gospel, to hear what God is saying to them from his word. So being regular in that way in church and regularly reading your Bible and reg regularly praying, it's such an important part of our relationship uh, to God. And the third thing uh, I'm, I'm reminded of when I see these blue tits every year, what they start doing is before they actually start taking stuff into the box to make their nest, they take out stuff that's maybe old uh, and uh, any stuff that shouldn't be there, like old feathers or whatever, even after they've built their nest, you'll find them coming out of the wee hole and just taking that out and throwing it away. So they want to keep the nest clean. That's important for us too. We have to keep our lives clean. The Lord wants us to be holy and to deal with our sins, with the dirty things spiritually that make our lives a mess and bring that to God so that we can actually have our sins forgiven by himself. So what's it for? It's to worship God. It's to glorify God. It's to give him praise. We come regularly not just now and again, we come as soon, as often as we can. And it's also a means of keeping, or trying to keep our lives clean so that we keep on looking at our lives and confessing our sins and looking for God constantly to clean us. So let's now say the Lord's Prayer together. It's on the bulletin again, you can read it. Okay. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if you would turn with me, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to look at the whole of this chapter this morning and see if we can summarize its teaching in a number of points. Teaching by comparisons is something that you frequently find in the Old Testament. It was done through Old Testament times. It was just one method of learning that was used and is often there in the wisdom books of the Old Testament, that's to say Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, especially in those books you find this method. If you go back to the previous book, book of uh, Proverbs, for example, chapter uh, 16, just one example out of many, uh, chapter 16 and at verse 32, uh, you'll find the following. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. That's a very similar thing. It's almost identical to the kind of teaching in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, where you find the words better than where you find one thing compared to another in order to bring out the teaching that the writer intends to bring out from it. And ten times in the book of Ecclesiastes, you find these comparisons. So it's obviously a very important feature in the book to convey the teaching that you find throughout it. There are four, actually, in this chapter itself, as we'll see today. Look at verse 3. You'll find... Uh, in verse 3, but better is both than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds done under the sun. So, better than. Find the same in verse 6. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. In verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. And finally, in verse 13, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king. So we're going to look at these three uh, or four better thans, especially looking at uh, the second, third, and fourth of these. But we'll look at the first one, as you find in verse 3, because really that's where he's setting um, what, what follows on in the other three. And we'll see something of the logic of them, I hope, as we go through them in that way. So verse 3 uh, you find better than there, better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. And that refers back, obviously, to the verses before that, where it talks about oppression and those in power and nobody to comfort those who are oppressed. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive, but better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds done under the sun. In other words, he's saying, better not been born than see the evil deeds, the oppression, the things that are done in that way under the sun, in the lot of human beings. We frequently think, or sometimes think, well, I'm glad so-and-so isn't alive to see this. That can be something from what's happening in the world, like the evils that you see in the world, the terrible things that you find, um, the distasteful things that you find in our society today. Maybe it's somebody that you knew was very careful about how they kept their house, how they kept their garden, that house is subsequently sold. Maybe it's gone through a few hands down through the years, and as you look at it today, it's a mess. It's a bit of a wreck. It's, it's um, uh, the garden's overgrown. The house has never really been attended to. It looks just pathetic. And you say, well, I'm glad so-and-so isn't alive. The previous occupant that you knew, I'm glad he or she's not alive to see this. It's better that she or, or he would never see this. And here you find the observation in verse 1, all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. He's come to this observation of the injustices, the exploitations, the pain that you find in the world under the sun, all the ways in which people mistreat one another, but especially in oppressions and exploitations and these really uh, oppressive 
uh, a kind of behavior that you find so often, sadly, in human life. This is what he observed. I observed them, he says, that are done under the sun. On the side of the oppressors, there was power, as it always is. And on the side of the oppressed, there was no one to comfort them. So it's, it's not just um, that you find so much oppression, so much done that causes pain and, and hurt and persecution to people. It's just also that nobody came to help them. There were few willing to just um, take note of the thing and come to try and help out in the situation. There's a lack of concern to rectify what seemed to be wrong, what is really causing the hurt and the pain. And isn't that really very much as it is today? Isn't that really something that's illustrated by the Lord's own teaching of what we know as the Good Samaritan, especially the first two figures that are mentioned there, the priest and the Levite, they saw this man that had been mugged and left badly beaten by the roadside in the ditch, and there they were, they passed by on the other side. Both of them refused to go over to even have a look at this man. They knew he was in trouble, they knew that he had been badly beaten, but they just didn't want to know. And isn't that how it often is? In our, in our society today. People say, that's not my business. Oh, no, I'm not getting involved. I don't want to be involved in anything like that. You come to report a crime, no, I don't want to, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to be involved. It's, it's out of my hands. It's somebody else's business. And, of course, that can actually make its way, sadly, into the church as well, where people will say, well, yeah, okay, I'm happy to belong to the church, I'm happy to come and be part of that, but don't ask me to do such and such a thing. It's not for me. Leave that to the elders, leave that to the minister, leave it to the deacons, leave it to the membership, leave it to the communicants. Um, so whatever you find um, a reluctance to get involved, it's something that's important to take note of and to rectify. But... This is really dealing with something much more than that. It's oppression, it's exploitation, it's just mistreating people badly. And that's what he saw, and that's what he actually did. And his conclusion was, well, it's better that you had not yet that you had not ever been born than that you, than that you see such things. You see terrible things in the world. You hear about terrible things. That's what the writer is actually doing. He's observing the kind of things you hear about, even if you don't actually see them. Thankfully, we don't actually see them in our own immediate locality, though there are things there that you don't want to see either. But especially throughout the world where you see the terrible things that are done to human beings by human beings. Maybe you come then to be somewhat like the writer here. You're better off actually not having been born and to come to really see these sort of things. Well, is that it? Is that the only thing he can say? Is he just throwing up his hands in despair and leaving it at that? Is he saying, well, there's nothing I can do about it either, though I'm seeing such a thing in the world under the sun? I'll just leave it at that. Well, of course, that's not what he's doing, because he moves on to deal with this and to deal with it in a way that tries to make sense of it or tries at least to find some way of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of dealing with it in a way that's meaningful and gives purpose to life. That's what we're seeing really through the book of Ecclesiastes, as we said at the beginning, is looking for some meaning, some meaning, some purpose, something meaningful in human life, even amongst all the tragedies and the exploitation and the suffering and the pain and the death that you see. He's looking for something where he can detect a purpose for human life, a meaningfulness, a benefit in living as human beings. So the second point is verses 4 to 5, which we can say it's better to be content than frustrated in toil. Then I saw that all the toil and all the skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. There's also his vanity and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh, Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Better have contentment or be content with your lot than frustrated in toil. Look at what he's saying, first of all, in verse 4. There's a toiling here from envy, he says. 
I saw all the toil and all the skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. Now, in a sense, he's, being, he's exaggerating. They're not absolutely all the work and the toil that you find in the world can be attributed to jealousy or envy of your neighbor or keeping up with the Joneses, as it's usually put, or something like that. But he is saying that a lot of it is. And really, it brings before us something very, very important in the Bible's own teaching, and that's the ethic of work, our approach to work, our approach to labor. What should we be thinking of when we come to think about work? And he's saying here uh, that he saw that toil and skill and work were coming from a man's envy of his neighbor. It's driven by a selfish heart. He's looking especially at that part of human labor, of human work, that's driven by selfishness, that's driven by a selfish desire and a selfish heart, and that's what he's observing especially. And even if we know ourselves that it's not true of everybody, it might only be true of ourselves, but this is certainly the worldly view of work, the worldly person's view of labor. This is the kind of ethic or lack of ethics, really, that the person uses who just strives to outdo other people and make as much for himself or herself as they can. That's what really he's saying. It comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and a striving after wind. It's the kind of person who says, I'm not happy with my status. I'm not happy especially when I see the status that other people have or that my neighbor has. I need a better status than that. I need to raise myself up in life. I need a better car. I need a bigger house. I need something that uh, other people can look to. I look to uh, uh, something that can actually then outdo what I see in other people. Even looks. don't like my looks. Better have surgery. Better actually have some kind of celebrity or that sort of uh, appearance. Well, some of us don't have the luxury of having the money to deal with the bags under our eyes and wrinkles and all that. But here is the selfish man's view of life. Here's the selfish man's envy of his neighbor. He is toiling from envy. He's really grinding it out because he wants to be better than other people because he wants to outdo them. That's his philosophy of life. That's what he's living life for. So what's the other alternative? What's the opposite of that? Well, it's in verse 5. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Here's somebody who thinks he's better off not working at all, who just wants to be idle all day, who just doesn't want to um, get his hands dirty or to really uh, exert himself or herself in anything in life. And it looks like that's really a much better way than the person that's toiling through envy of his neighbor. Here's somebody who's saying, I'm not going to bother with that. I don't know. I don't want to, to outdo other people. I'm happy just to put my feet up and not do anything, and I'll just live off what people actually give me. And he thinks that that is actually a benefit to him. But notice what it says. He eats his own flesh word for that really is cannibalistic. Cannibals. The horrid thing that cannibalism is, where people eat human flesh, or used to be the case in some tribes in the world. That's what he's really saying. Literally, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. It's self calamitism What does he mean by that? It means that he's actually destroying the very things that ought to give him dignity that ought to present himself as a human being made by God to labor, to work, to the glory of God. You know, God has a lot to say in the Bible about laziness, about shirking our responsibilities. Let me just pick out one or two, Proverbs chapter 24, again going back to, to Proverbs. There's a, a really graphic and powerful picture there in Proverbs chapter 24, Near the end of the chapter, he says, I passed by, verse 30, I passed by the field of a sluggard, a lazy man, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want 
like an armed man. He's making no provision for the future whatsoever. He's just saying, a little more sleep, a little more slumber. I'm okay. I'll just live life as it is. I'll, I'll just idle along and everything's going fine. But you're building nothing for the future. You're destroying your own dignity as well, as Ecclesiastes is saying to us here. He is eating his own flesh. Remember what Paul said when he wrote to the Thessalonians. There was obviously a problem for some in the Thessalonian church that they weren't willing to just um, join in the work that was necessary. He says, now we command you, brothers, not just, uh, I think, in, the, in terms of the work in the church, but this was something that they just, uh, in their approach to life. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. And then he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. In other words, the ethic of work is important in the teaching of the Bible. When God placed Adam uh, in the Garden of Eden, he was surrounded by perfection. He himself was perfect. You might say, what were his needs? But what did God give him to do? He didn't just put him in the Garden of Eden to do nothing. He didn't put him there so he would get his sun bed out, put on his sunglasses and just lie back and enjoy the sun. He put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. God made human beings to work, not to be idle, but to work. The philosophy of the world, of the world sadly so much, is I need to work, I need to earn money so that I can enjoy my holidays, so that I can go abroad and lie in the sun and enjoy my holidays. There's nothing wrong with that enjoying the sun, going abroad, having a holiday. We all need it. But the philosophy is wrong when you start with earning so as to enjoy a holiday. Because the philosophy of the Bible is, I need a holiday so as to recharge for my work. I need a holiday so that I can actually be a better work person when I go back to work. That's the philosophy of the Bible. It's the other way about with the worldly person. So whether it's uh, the person that's just simply doing it from envy of his neighbor or the person who's just folding up his hands and saying, I'm not going to work at all, I'm far better off. No, the Lord has another thing to say. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. And that's really contentedness in your lot. Even if somebody else has got a lot more than we have, even if they're a lot more famous than we have, even if they've got more ability than we have for so many things, the Lord has given to us the portion that He's given to us in His providence. He's created us as we are. It doesn't mean we don't improve things. We can't improve on what we are and what we do. But what He's really saying here is, better is a handful of quietness, contentment, than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Well, you can see the imagery there. There's the two hands full of toil and a striving after wind, grasping, no room to actually uh, leave any, any uh, space in your hand for anything else. What he's saying is, there's the person that's always seeking to grab, they're always seeking to fill their hands with something, just striving after wind. Better is one hand with contentment than that. Contentment with God. Contentment with God's wisdom. Contentment with God's teaching. And with what God has allotted us, with God's providence, I know that's a difficult thing. Even Paul had to learn to be content in whatever uh, position he was in, but he did learn it. And it's for you and for me also to learn that that's how it is. That's what Paul was saying in Philippians 4, uh, that he had learned to, be, uh, to do without and he had learned to be full. I can do, he says, all things through Christ who strengthens us. See what he's saying? I have one handful of Christ. 
I've got space in my other hand for some other things, but seeing I've got Christ, I can do all other things through His strength. Are we content today with Jesus, with having Jesus? Do you want more than Jesus? Do you want more than the riches you find in Jesus? Is your heart not content with Christ Himself? Are you looking for answers in the world or in a worldly philosophy of life different to what God is saying for you in Christ? If you watch Master Chef, as I occasionally do, um, you'll find that uh, uh, to begin with, uh, in order to try and impress the judges, uh, this is one thing the judges often accuse them of or find fault with, they just cram so much onto the plates. Maybe there's three kinds of sauces, four kinds of vegetables, maybe even three kinds of meat, and it's all really f- just cramming the plate so full and trying to make it look nice. And you know the chef, the professional chefs, uh, the judges will turn around and say, you know, less is more. Less is more. It's a great phrase, isn't it? Less is more. Less of the grasping, less of, the, of um, what you find in verse 4, less of what you find in verse 5. That's more. That's contentment. That's the ethic with which to approach life. Better be content than frustrated in toil. Or you could say better be content with little or what God gives us than frustrated in toil. What's the third one? Well, better have fellowship than live in isolation from verse 6 through to verse 12. Uh, from verse, uh, yes, from, from what you find there, uh, from verse 6 to 12. Better is a handful of quietness and two hands full of toil. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person has no other, either son or brother, that there is no need uh, whom, who is no, uh, uh, sorry, he's never satisfied with riches. He never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil and so on. Now here's somebody whose deliberate choice is to live life on their own. That's to say to isolate themselves. It's not something that's come about by accident. It's not something beyond their control. It's something that they've chosen actually to be. They don't like sharing life with anybody else. They don't like somebody else coming to offer to help them. They don't like that sort of involvement. So it's better, he says, to have fellowship than live in isolation. Better than the two are better than one, right down to verse 12 there. It's a selfish isolationism, but as, as well as that, you get the impression from the words that are used there um, where you find about falling, there's no one to lift him up, and if two lie together, there's how, how can they keep warm and so on. There's a, a sense there where you've got really a compulsive materialism. It's not just that the person likes to be on their own, but they like to be on their own because they don't want to share things with others. And they want to make as much as they can for themselves and keep it to themselves and not really think of the need of other people or the benefit of sharing out with other people. And he says that's really a terribly tragic life. For one thing, he's illustrating it and saying if if, if there are two together, at least if one falls, then his companion or his fellow can help lift him up, get him back on his feet again. And that's true not just physically, that's true also in terms of uh, our life and uh, the uh, situations we find ourselves in, sometimes when we fall, sometimes when we fall spiritually, sometimes when we fall morally, we need others to help us get back on our feet. And we need to be helpers of each other to help us get back on our feet. The willingness to be helped and the willingness to help go hand in hand. So here's a man who has a deliberate choice to be on his own or on her own. And it affects every aspect of life. And he's a compulsive materialist at the same time. He's cramming life full of everything he can get and everything he can earn. And he's not willing to share. A kind of Scrooge fellow, if you like, kind of Scrooge figure who just uh, goes around grumbling that he never has enough and doesn't share what he has with anyone else. And the benefits, he says, of fellowship, you can see better than that, is having somebody with you, somebody in friendship, somebody in fellowship. And that applies to all walks of life, doesn't it? 
It applies to every aspect and every avenue of life. It's particularly mentioned in the Bible in terms of the church and what the church is. Remember that the church is not a building. The church today here is you, you people, you and I together. That's the church, not the building we meet in. Because even if this building didn't exist and we had nowhere to actually meet except perhaps out on the moor, which sometimes happened in the history of our nation, there's still the church. That is still the church meeting together wherever they are. Of course, the building is important in terms of facilitating our worship and our meetings. But let's not forget what the church is or who the church is. It's the people who gather to worship God. What he's saying is, uh, what the Bible is reminding us of is, along with what he's saying here is, it's hugely important in the Bible to look at what it says about the assembly of God's people in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament you come to Paul teaching about the body, the body of Christ, using the analogy of the human body, the different parts of the body under the head. You have the arms, you have the hands, you have the, the legs, you have the rest of the body. They all function in their own way. They all have, each of them has a particular function that is uh, applicable to itself. And that's why Paul says, the body can't function if the hand says, I've no need of the rest of you. Or if the foot says, I don't need any hands to this body. It needs all the different parts to function properly. And that's what Paul is using to illustrate the richness of the body of Christ, the richness with which God has endowed that body of Christ with a variety of gifts and callings that you find within it. Look at this, this audience today, this congregation today. As I look out from this pulpit, I see all kinds of gifts. I see all kinds of age groups. I see all kinds of qualities, all kinds of different endowments by God for the benefit of His people. That's the body of Christ. That's what you see emphasized in Scripture. And that's why belonging to the church, being a part of the church, what I was saying earlier about uh, the children, even in prayer, mentioning to God and thanking God for them, for the noise of their young voices, because that's such a rich facet of any congregation's life. And that's how he finishes here. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's just an image. I think it's just used as an image just to reinforce what he's saying. A single cord might go so far to bear certain weights. If you double it and put two cords together, it'll then really take much more weight. If you do it again and you have a threefold cord, well, that's not quickly broken. If you take a human hair, and you know how, how incredibly thin a human hair is? If you take a human hair, a single strand of human hair, especially straight hair like mine, because we're told, I'm told anyway, uh, that, that curly hair isn't as strong, obviously, because there are these kinks in it, but straight hair, a single strand of straight hair can hold 100 grams in weight. You go on to Google, you can see experiments proving that. If you triple that, you can actually find a lot more than three times 100 grams. And if you take a head of hair, or a head of healthy hair, if you take all the hairs in a person's head, put them together into a cord, you will actually get something that can support 12 tons. That's the weight of two elephants. See what that's saying? Something that seems to be as flimsy as a human hair. You just wind a few together. You take a whole head of hair. You can hold up and lift two large elephants with that. And what it's saying really here to us is, see the benefit of fellowship. See the strength you get from fellowship. The strength not just for each person within that fellowship to actually have something for themselves to develop 
as they interact with others. It's not just simply the strength that's given to each of us when we belong to the church, when we actually know the benefit of being in a fellowship of God's people. It's actually also the strength of the whole body, the strength that uh, God has given to His church. I know it's His own strength that fills His church. It's His own strength that gives us the strength. But what this is saying is, when we act together, when we know the benefits of unity, when we have a cord made up of all of us and all our gifts together, that's virtually unbreakable. But the strongest cord of all is the cord of Christ's love. That is unbreakable. The love of Jesus with which you are tied to him and your love to him. As a Christian today, all of you today who know the Lord as your Lord, this is the strongest cord in existence, the love with which Christ holds your life, the love that binds you to him, his own love for you, not your love for him or my love for him. There is no cord in existence as strong as the love of God in Christ Jesus. Are you tied to him? Do you have that advantage? Is this true of your life? That whatever happens and whatever relationships do break as they do, and whatever things you find in this life that give you pain, whatever breaches there may be, however much things may come to an end, and fill you with sadness. Is it true of your life that you can say today, for all that may happen to me, I know that this will never happen, that the cord of Christ's love to which I'm tied will never break. What is more assuring than that? What is more reassuring than that? What is more beneficial than that? What is of greater urgency than to know that? And to have that for yourself. Threefold cord, this union with Jesus especially, can never be broken. Better have fellowship than live in isolation. Better be content than frustrated in toil. And finally, better be teachable or have a teachable mind than intellectual pride. Now, the final few verses of the chapter uh, are not necessarily very easy to follow. And the principle of it is, it's talking about a poor and wise youth, and it's better to be that than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. And I think it's talking of the youth in verse 14. This youth went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and striving after wind. Well, of course, it does say there that popularity doesn't go on forever. And even a king who is popular doesn't go on forever. But what it's really saying is that it's better to have a teachable mind than one that is just stuffed with pride and doesn't want to really take any advice from other people. That's really the key, I think, in verse 13, the old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. Well, that's the key issue of a disciple. That's the key feature of a disciple of Jesus, because the word disciple means a pupil, a follower, one who learns, a student. And to be a type, to be a, dis a disciple of Jesus means to be his student, his followers in the sense of coming under his teaching. And you remember how he himself talked about taking his yoke upon us. That's what they did in those days. That's how they referred to coming under the teaching of a rabbi. You take the yoke of the person on you. You come under that person's teaching. And Jesus used that of himself. Take my yoke upon you. Come to me. All you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
He's talking about those people who find it impossible, who found it impossible to live under the rules of the Pharisees who had added so much to the law of God of their own minute rules, man-made rules. But he says, you come to me. You won't have that. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Come under my teaching. Become my disciple. Become my pupil. And you will find rest for your soul. And Jesus himself is the perfect example of a teachable mind. Though he was the Son of God and came into this world by taking our nature, our human nature, as a servant, Luke chapter 2, there he is, teaching the doctors of the law in the temple. And his parents, his uh, mother and Joseph, looking for him, finally found him there, were annoyed with him. And he went home, he went back to his home with them, and he was subject to them. See what that's saying? Here's the one who is fully capable of teaching everybody else as the Son of God. But he's got a teachable mind, a teachable spirit. He's under Mary and Joseph's parentage. And he's showing that teachable mind. He listens to them as a child and takes their advice as a human child. And then in Proverbs chapter 19, let me just finish with that text again. Proverbs 19 verse 20. Again, speaking about this teachable mind and how it's better than intellectual pride. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future or for the future. Better have that teachable mind than an intellectual pride and closed to advice. So there is the passage, better not being born than see evil deeds. But you don't just throw your hands up and say, well, what's the point to life? No, you'd better be content with what God gives than frustrated in toil. Better a fellowship than live in isolation. Better have a teachable mind than intellectual pride. May God bless these thoughts to us. Now may grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be your portion now and evermore. Amen.